Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Someday with thanks, thanks for sharing, thank you for sharing, and then her, and then <coughs> transcendence. <laughs> Nikita lost the feeling in her legs after that. She made it, made it up to her room, but that was that. So. She started to disappear like Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't have any green powder <laughs> left to stop it, so she's got cotton legs this morning. <laughs> well, this has been like, wow, we've had such a great series of uh, retreats out here over the years. We don't know if this is the last one or not, but it has a feeling like we, we had a grand slam with all of you. <laughs> That's the way it feels. If the place goes, thanks for the memories. <laughs> yeah, this has been a knock your socks off uh, ten days. Just, yeah. Yeah, for us, I'm sure for all of you. And some of you, I think, are just kind of in a hum or a buzz that you just want to stay in it. You don't really want to move from <laughs> the hum. <laughs> Or like my three-legged cat just gets into a deep purr. She just likes to stay in her purr. She purrs the world away. The world disappears. She really gets the motor going. And all is well. <laughs> so because we've had such depth and um, sometimes questions come up of what now or what's next or next steps, um, or sometimes after such a full experience, you <clears throat> some things that were not clear at all start to become clear, and maybe you're on the cusp of, you know, you feel like you're on the cusp of, of settling into something very deep. So we really felt that this last morning would be, we would just all show up and be fully available and uh, very, very open to spirit, just to join with you all very, very deeply and just let the Spirit guide us and direct us this morning for a couple hours and then uh, have a nice little closing circle and, and then a brunch, which I understand is going to be served down, down yeah. there, or do we know? We don't know yet. Do you think so? We served the campground. Campground, okay. So, well, I, I would think probably after this discussion is best for all, any kind of photos and hugs and everything, because the brunch is downstairs and down in the campground, and then I think a couple vehicles are leaving at noon, so <coughs> yeah, it's best to get that in. So, we just thought we would open it up with everyone, and just, we're open to anything <laughs> for our closing discussion here. And that's just what I have to share, if you have anything to share. No. Sylvia. I just want to thank the Holy Spirit, because today I really planned on just serving leftovers to a few amount of people. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, I have no leftovers. And so obviously, and the meal is really perfect. Everything we needed came together. So I think the Holy Spirit knew that we would have to make a meal even before we did. Wow. Yeah. So I, I really, and I went out I went outside for a moment and this all hit me how just everything, literally everything we needed was there. And so I said a big thank you and right after I did some noise out in the woods started rattling as if it was answering me. <laughs> so here is my formal thank you and thank you for the experience. It's, I've loved every minute of it. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. That's another idea we had too. If anybody had something to share, like kind of like what their experience was, even of the movie retreat too, that's open for that. Anything, anything and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just in such gratitude because my experience has been that there really is no barriers to love, pres love's presence. There just really aren't. They're they're imagined, and in truth, they're the gateway. Um, 
So yeah, that's, that's it. That was kind of, you were hearing from Sylvia the rest of the story, and then we were amazed because the, I got an email from you about, was it about a week and a half or something before? A couple of weeks. A couple of weeks before that she wrote, I lost my cook. <laughs> Any ideas? <laughs> so I said, hmm, try Sylvia and everything. But it, so it's been going on, that same kind of thing, with just enough the right ingredients for the last meal, and, and literally we have a friend in Salt Lake City who, this is Bruce, was going to be our cook, and then I lost my cook, and so it's just been central casting, I call it. Yeah. Uh, central casting always does a great job, and, and then you start to really relax, and you start to see that that transfers to your whole life. Central casting is always sending someone in or someone out, and, and it's just amazing. And you can actually take a deep breath and relax, like, wow, central casting is actually doing a very good job, a great job. Casting has been perfect. <laughs> it's like, you know, everyone, it's just like everyone, yeah, like I'm saying it's a retreat, and it's, but it's like it feels like it's hand picked. Everyone just specifically, it's like you, 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 you to be here. And it's like, I feel like, on one hand, I feel like I've picked each and every one, but not on a personal level. But it's very, like, so even that was precise in a way. It's just like, who is to be here in a, like, beyond form. And it's just like, because this is what's giving, it's like, you know, it's just like, the vibe. The vibe is so deep, and you just like, I could just feel it, the ones that are going to make it here. It's like, they're going to be the ones with the full yes in their hearts. And so there was like, every time there was an invitation, it's like, I... It's like I fully expected yes, yes, and it's like it's given, you know. Even when I called Sylvia, it's like Sylvia, you're to be here, but I have a, a like a booking. <laughs> it's like no, you don't. <laughs> you're to be here. <laughs> it's like okay, <laughs> and then and then she calls back. Yeah, I'm to be here. Yeah, okay, done. <laughs> it's like and like this is not random because I felt it in my heart. This is not. None of it is random. No one, no one who is invited is at random. It's like a very direct, specific, specific invitation from the spirit, and so it's been just so, yeah, it's been so great. And then there's nothing else. I feel like I, that's all I ever did. I actually, I, I didn't even do that. You know, I was like, if someone asked me like, how did it happen? What did you do? I'd be like, I didn't do anything. <laughs> it was just like a very a very grand, I need do nothing. <laughs> Just, yeah, yeah. It was very fun to, to join with Nikita <laughs> because when we had a call with Sylvia, with the call with Sylvia, I was with Nikita and she always said, no, I can't, you know, I'm booked and it's just not really possible. And Nikita was like, um, no. She was like very direct, <laughs> and and she yeah. It's it's beautiful. She feels like she's doing nothing, but spirit is really very direct and doing it very clearly. And another thing was when Suzanne and I came to Nikita and said, you know, we need to plan breakfast. Um, you know, people in the world used to have breakfast. She's like, breakfast? Are you still thinking about those things? <laughs> <laughs> so we had a lot of, it was a lot of fun. It was very simple and very direct to arrange this retreat with Nikita. <laughs> That's why it's been such a powerful experience, I think, because it, it was simple and clear and direct. Grand slam. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing short of a grand slam. And the thing is, it's like, the, the older way of looking at things was very linear, and you know, you're a person, you got to arrange things and get there and handle logistics and everything. And, and quantum is more like, some of you know a little bit about quantum physics and superposition and how, you know, for years they tried to discover what is the, the, the building blocks, what's the smallest thing that all of this is made of, and then they got down to the atom, finally, and then they started going inside the atom, and they found out it was mostly space. Really, was nothing. They they were looking for like you know 
just like with a house that's made of bricks, you know, you find the cornerstone where the house started, but you know, you go smaller and smaller, it's, all, it's just space. It's somewhere like a mirage that looks like it's solid. And it's all superposition, so basically it's just, what you perceive in this world is like a snapshot of what you believe in your consciousness right now. So look around at all of this, and the canyons and everything, and this is like a snapshot of your mind. And if you're feeling really relaxed and engulfed in love and everything, then it's because that love is just radiating through you. And this is just a picture, it's like a postcard, your mind is giving yourself a little postcard of, of what it believes. Because the mind is always showing us what we believe. And, and that's good, it's a good thing. If you, especially if you're going for purity, purification, you get a, this is like a little, uh, like a barometer. You know, what you're perceiving is a barometer. So if you had a wonderful week or ten days and you perceive lots of witnesses of love, then that's a good barometer of your consciousness. But it's not, you ha it's like we don't have to think like that anymore. We, we have to give up this older way of thinking that, of, that we have a personal life, that we have a personal history, that we have maybe some goals and ambitions for the future. The more you get into love, it's the, some of those future goals and ambitions start to get kind of wavy. Like, whoa, I, I thought I had a clue uh, what was coming next, but my whole life I learned very on, early on in my 20s, like late 20s, that, that I really couldn't have a clue where things were seeming to go in the future. It felt very awkward because everyone around me was like, you know, planning out their future and seemed pretty certain, you know, oh, I'm going to get married and have kids and I'm going to live in this kind of house and I'm going to, I like to live in this location and all these specific things. And I, that even struck me when I, when I was little because I would have friends, I'm going to be a fireman when I grow up and I'm going to be a princess or a prima donna <laughs> dancer or something. And I would just kind of look around at the other kids and go, you seem pretty certain. <laughs> you know, it's like, I was always, how come I don't know what I'm going to be? And I never, even through high school, I didn't know what I was going to be when I grew up. And then and after 10 years of university, I still didn't know what I was going to be when I would grow up. And they'd give me all these tests, you know, test scores to kind of test your abilities and your interests and try to, you know, map it all out. And my, my scores were always really crazy, funny pictures that the guidance counselors couldn't understand. They'd say, well, we've never seen anything like that. Uh, but we'll keep trying, you know, they just kept, we'll find something for you, we'll find something, but that's our job. <laughs> but it didn't work out, and so I think, yeah, after watching some of these movies and everything we've gone through this week, you're, you're a little more loosened from thinking that you have a clue of how the form needs to go. Because you get touch, you touch into that happiness, you touch into that lightness and love and laughter and joy, and, and that feels great. You know, that's something you can dive into and go for, but it's a little like, ooh, how's it going to look in form? And <laughs> Nicholas is like, Am I, I'm, I'm saying something that you completely relate to. <laughs> All of our camera work is going to have his voice. <laughs> That's good. You're the laugh track for our, our uh, filming. The people will be like, what's that? Ha 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 ha. In the background of the whole movie, <laughs> the whole movie right? <laughs> Someone's having a good time. <laughs> oh, it's the cameraman. <laughs> Uh, the, um, <laughs> it's not even a word, but the only thing uh, that was coming to me when you're asking about experience of even just the movie retreat was like, <laughs> just, <laughs> not, <laughs> like, where am I? Like, wait, what's my name again? Like, <laughs> just <laughs> kind of what Nikita was saying. Like, all every morning, it's just like, where am I again? Like, <laughs> it's been so, um, it's been so powerful and. So healing, I can't even remember like when this started really. <laughs> just like every day is just so deep, like every moment is just like, wow. <laughs> so thank you, really. I feel 
even more humbled <laughs> everything I thought I knew. <laughs> That's you. beautiful that you would share that too, because so I said the other day um, that, that when you come for such a long retreat, you get a glimpse of, of com our community living, we call it, and it's not so much describable in form, um, because we've even had um, our friends Christian and Pam and Suzanne, you know, writing this book, Modern Day Monk, trying to put it down in words. And it's been kind of an interesting collaborative experience for them. It's been very healing, but, but even what seems to be the byproduct of all that collaboration and joining, it seems to be more of a snapshot of how the community was uh, a couple years ago, two or three years ago. Because people in our community would read it and go, oh yeah, this is nostalgic, you know, kind of like this. <laughs> This is, oh yes, yeah, this is how it was, but, but it's more that thing of losing track of, of time and not really knowing where you are. You're just so swept away, swept up in the experience and, and that means that you obviously gave yourself permission, your, you gave your mind permission to, to go into that, to loosen from the day-to-day the -day specifics of the world and, and kind of soar into that. And really that's the ultimate of community living, or any kind of living, whether you're solo in the woods, or you have a, in a relationship, or you're in a community situation, or whatever. You, when you give yourself permission to just soar, and you just allow yourself to stay soaring, that's you, the means and end have come together. The, the soaring is the end, and the soaring is the means. And it's like you're, you're a bird, you're just a just up and the wind is carrying you. You know, you're not thinking about how you're going to make ends meet or where you're going to go. You, you don't think that these eagles that we see flying by or have a thought process of, I wonder where I'm going to go, should I fly over there or should I fly there? You know, they're not into hypothetical thinking. A lot of it depends on how the wind is, you know, they're just really going with the wind and they just will kind of just soar a lot. And that's, and that's like a state of being, just soaring. So, um, it's great that, that you have that, because when the mind <laughs> comes to a, a retreat or a community experience and it's got expectations of how it's supposed to be, it never works out the way that the mind sets it up as it's supposed to be this way or that way. It's just a difficult experience when there's expectations. And when you're soaring, then you find yourself laughing a lot and you just feel like you've fallen in love with everything and everyone but you do lose track of time. And I used to have this, I have a little peace house in Cincinnati where Eric and Ricky are going to be going, and Jenny and Greg and, and some others, but I would just be in this house, it was built in 1847, and I would just get into these soaring states of mind, and absolutely I lost track of what day it was. I, I had no clue ever what day it was, or what month or year either. I just gave myself full permission to go into this soaring experience. And the only thing I really, I mean, my tripod would let me know uh, when it was time to eat. She would just, bang, you know, be very vocal. And so I would, you know, give her the food and, but it wasn't like, we, we weren't on a schedule, like breakfast and dinner or anything like that. And then the only thing I, I felt that I needed to do was to take, the, have the trash go out, because the, the garbage truck would go, come by once a week. So I made a sign, garbage tonight, for the night before, but then of course I didn't know what day it was, so I, I, I would put the garbage tonight, like in my kitchen, the, the thing, and I would just say to the Holy Spirit, tell me when to put this on the counter. And then the Spirit would prompt me at some point, like it was like um, Friday mornings was garbage, trucks would go by, so sometime during Thursday afternoon or evening, I would get a prompt to move the sign off the refrigerator with the, the uh, little magnet and down onto the counter. So then when I was flowing around, I would see the sign on the counter. And that's how I got the garbage out. It, it took that to even get the garbage out. It took all of that, even a, a sign with a black marker. And you can see there's a lot of allowance and permission in that to really give yourself full permission. You're so worthy of that soaring experience. It's really, that's how we were created in this soaring experience. And, and we're really honoring God, not in words or actions, but 
when we allow ourselves to be in that experience, that's how we're honoring God, because God created us like that. And we're saying, oh, I am as you created me. So that's the honoring. It's not through words, you know, I, you see sometimes on TV, the, the Christians have their praise-a-thons, and glory God, Jesus, praise Jesus, and it just goes on for hours. Praise Jesus, praise Jesus. Except God, Jesus, God, they don't have an ego with which to receive all the <laughs> the congratulations in words, their spirit. And spirit is honored when we are in presence of spirit, not necessarily by saying praise, praise, glory, glory, praise, praise, glory, glory. You know, God knows not form. God doesn't even know about words. So if they think that there's some God, they're going, oh, thank you, thank you for praising me all day and all night. It's like our attitude is praise to God, not, not the words. That's just an attempt you know, to, to thank God. So thank you for sharing that experience you're having, because that's, that's like the ep epitome of what, for us, true living is about, is just feeling that, that joyful, soaring experience and losing track of time. And amazingly, everything gets handled. Look at everything. Everything got handled here. You know, isn't that amazing? <laughs> Without <laughs> such focus and concentration, it's, it works. It really works. Yeah, it works. yeah, it's like prayer works. It's just like, it just feel like, yeah, I feel like there's such permission. I feel it's just such deep worthiness to just allow yourself to just be in the prayer. Just like, and it makes no logic to the world. It makes no logic to, you know, to the, you know, to the logical thinking, it's like prayer, but things need to be done. Like I'd be a lot of times, I felt like I like before the festival. Actually, two months before or something, I was, I came here and then I was called to Camas. You know, it was just like busy, busy doings. You know, to be in function. And then at some point, I started, I started feeling, I had this deep feeling that I I have to go to the mountains, you know, like Jesus. I am to the mountains are calling me, and the mountains it was like the symbol of deep prayer and communion. I just it felt like I'm I'm being drawn somewhere. Like I have to like mountains are calling. It just like I have to be in that deep communion. And so the same day I. I just, I felt like, it felt like I just got teleported here. It's just like, oh, hello. <laughs> and then I went into this deep experience of just, like, there's been a lot of days, like, there's two weeks where I could barely move. Like, I would come down, you know, when it was, like, absolutely necessary, when I would get a prompt, but it was just like, I don't know, it was so abstract. And then again, in my mind, it was like the festival, I'm still to get, you know, I'm, I'm to be running the festival and get ready. And all I could hear was, no, you need to stay with me. You need to stay with me. And then from there on, it just went on even deeper and deeper. And then, and then everything would just like, I don't even know how it started to happen, but there was communication. But then every time, every time I would have a thought of, I need to do something, but I, it's like, it was just such a strong, Reminder, you are to be with me. Like, you are to be with me. And a lot of times it's like, what do you need? Like, I'd be like, okay, then I need help. He's like, what do you need? What do you need? I'd be like, I need help. And then go ask so-and-so. Go, uh, go ask, make a call and so that you can be back with me. So the whole, like, the whole, pro like, the whole practice so to speak was just to be in the prayer and i would like a lot of times i would just like f fall down on my knees in gratitude it's like really like this is what you want me to do like this is i can just do that because it feels like so simple and and yet this is it this is the ultimate experience this is the ultimate like power of the prayer that you're just staying in the prayer and it's like an ultimate loss of control you don't know like you and like you just don't know it felt like it was a very deep letting go of the world in that like in such a way and it's and it's just the more i went with it the more it's just like this is that's why i keep calling this path 
I call this path of the worthy. I was like, this is the path of the worthy. It's just, it's all, all there is. It's just like opening up to love. And it's like open, like letting, you know, allow spirit to love you. Allow spirit to show you what love is. Like without like let go of every thought of like what you, what do you, what you think that is and just allow it to be loved. And everything, everything that's here, that's, I always say, it's not about, like that's what I've said it numerous times, it's not about the festival. Like it really isn't. Like it, when I say it's not about the festival, it's not like, but yeah, real, but it is kind of sometimes. It just really is about like everything is being used to really to let go of the world, it's like Argo, you know, like it's a fake movie, right? It's just really, everything is used to really, these are just th the festival, these are just the means to escape from the world. This is like the grand escape that we were like, that we were all involved in, like as the mind, as one, as this. So just to allow that escape and into, you know, into the unknown, into the vastness. So, yeah, the, it's it's just amazing, and and I could feel it. I could so feel it that I feel like everyone had that experience here. I could I could just feel it, and and I'm like I, I think I don't think I'm wrong. I just could feel everyone in that state of like <gasps> like vastness falling slash soaring. Call it either way, and. Uh, yeah, because I thought, like, yeah, this is the gift. Like, this is the gift. Yeah, there's a movie I've watched within the past year. It was called To the Wonder. And I loved it. It was such a poetic and mystical movie. But it was really about falling in love. And then, and then the wonder is the miracle, to the miracle, you know, to the wonder. And then, then this contrast experience of, of struggle or of sadness or hurt or anger or betrayal, all this other stuff, it was almost like the movie was like a, a, a question mark. It was, it, was, it was showing and demonstrating such spectacular love you know, when people fall in love, there's just nothing like that experience of just falling deeper and deeper and deeper in love. And then the question mark is, why does it have to be any different than this? Why can't it always be the wonder? Why can't we just live in a state of, of continuous wonder? You know, sometimes you get a glimpse of it with children, you know, where they're just playing and they're so gleeful and they're just running around or we're like a dog <laughs> wagging his tail. It's so happy. It's so happy. It's like it's in the wonder. And then, wow, this other thing, what a bummer. You know, <laughs> it's like, why can't I always be in the wonder? Why, why does life have to have this other stuff in it? Uh, and so, I think with the spiritual pathway, so to speak, or the spiritual opening, you start to see that, of course, you deserve the wonder. You are worthy of the wonder. and. And actually, you are the wonder. Uh, all this talk of miracles, Jesus has his big, big book called A Course in Miracles, and at one point he comes out and he says, you are a miracle. <laughs> it's like, whoa! <laughs> you know, you're reading all, you're trying to get all the technical specifics, you know, the 50 principles, and miracles are natural, when they do not occur, something has gone wrong, and you know, you're kind of studying it, you're being very studious, you know, to try to really Okay, I'm going to get this, I'm going to study this, I'm going to study your book, and I'm going to find out what this miracle is. And then he comes out, you are a miracle. And he's not talking about personality self-you, but he's talking about the you, the real you, the, the, the real self, the capital I, I, the, the I am-ness, you know. And so, isn't that an adventure, though, when you start to experience the wonder and you say, wow, I would love to have this be continuous. I would love to be in a state of wonder. And that we can, we can, that was the, the heartbreak of the To the Wonder movie was the, the sense of, uh, isn't it a shame that it doesn't last? Um, 
But for me, the, I saw it the other way around. It was like, I, I could feel like, thank you for this wondrous experience. Thank you for giving me something that lasts, that goes on and on and on and on. It never dips. It doesn't dip away from itself. It's, it's just what it is. And that truly just by devoting yourself to miracles, you know, to saying, okay, maybe I don't know that I am the miracle, but can I be a miracle worker? <laughs> Start off with, the, can I show up as a miracle worker and you'll take me to I am the miracle. You know, that's, that's a wondrous life. You know, and there was a, I think there was this, the 2001 Space Odyssey, then there was the one that came after it, what was it, 2000 and or it was the sequel. But my friend Thomas St. Clair used to uh, give me a quote from that one, and he loves saying it. And the, the quote from that movie was, something wonderful is about to happen. He loves saying that. Something wonderful is about to happen. Just saying it with all the, the anticipation. And that's really what you have to look for now look forward to in your life was is something wonderful is about to happen. <coughs> something wonderful is happening. <laughs> you know, I was just, I was Do we have a mic? <laughs> just sitting here look just sitting here looking for something. I, I know I brought some with me. It's not in my pockets and I packed my stuff up. Has anybody seen my cares? <laughs> <laughs> Over there. Right there. Marissa wants it. Yeah, I don't know why I want this, but my body's just like, yes, 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 and something so wonderful is about to happen and is happening, and and I just feel like I'm trans, or I have transformed from this tree, this like tree, to this <laughs> bird, <laughs> or something, um, so much lighter, so much lighter. Uh, I am just infinitely grateful and oh. <sighs> every every moment here has been so incredibly perfect. Every person that I've looked in the eyes, every hug that I've had, every scream, every cry, every frustration, it's all just so perfect and there's just so much trust in in what's happening and I don't know what's happening and I don't know why I'm here I don't know what I'm doing <laughs> I don't know what's going on and it's just so funny like the, just watching this ability to be able to laugh at things you know it's like everything is funny <laughs> and it was so not funny in the beginning it was so not funny <laughs> oh. <laughs> mm. and this this yeah just language like I've I've always been this mover and feeler and and love, love. talking to people <laughs> Yeah, love, love, so much love. It's like whoa like love, love. It is so <laughs> it is so present and, and I'm just, you know Yeah, I, I'm really learning that I was so afraid of love and and I've always, you know, <sighs> I've always wanted to give it and receive it and I have, but here it's like, it's just totally surrendering to like fully being in it and I just have to say something about language as well because, yeah, going back to this feeling, moving self, you know, conversations with people. It's like, I, I just didn't want to talk to so many people. 
because words words were always weird for me and they still are and I feel like I found uh, a sense of being home here because it's like language is like so so like it's such just a little tiny part and it I just feel like uh accepted here and then totally lost and not lost and oh just really grateful is the only is really what it comes down to just so grateful for every experience and for opening to the Holy Spirit and listening and yeah like losing losing feeling and really surrendering to this spontaneity that's like whoa and, and all the help that's been given willingness to ask for help like it's just so I don't have any control anymore and I really love you all so much Love you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know how um, spirit always finds us where we are and speaks to us in whatever language we need to understand. Obviously, the Holy Spirit found me in the kitchen. <laughs> so that parable of having everything you need is something I needed to learn personally. And I was reminded of that every day, especially in this last meal we're having together. So, I can't think of a better gift. Seriously, thank you all from the bottom of the, my heart. Thank you to the Holy Spirit for making it possible. Hmm. Yeah, that's always precious to me because Sylvia and I had corresponded some and you would really pour it out like, like it was almost like the the rug was getting pulled or the floor kept dropping out, like doing the things you'd done before and it had worked. And then them not working anymore. And then putting effort into this and then the, it's, it's like an unwinding or a, there's a, there's a, I think it's the second of the stages of the development of trust where he's, Jesus says, it will seem as if things are being taken away from you. And that can be a very disorienting phase when you think you've played by the rules and you, you're pretty good at making sure you have the right stuff around you and have your act together and all the stuff that we're taught is to be a mature, functioning adult citizen and everything. And then when that starts to fall apart and, and like that old, uh, there, was a, there was an amusement park ride called the Rotor. I don't know if you ever rode on the Rotor, but you would kind of, it would spin around and you would have your body pressed against the side and then the floor would drop out. You'd be like, and the, there was no solid floor underneath you. It was, it was kind of that centrifugal kind of force or whatever. So, I can see Sundari. She's. That was my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> that was my very favorite. Now ride. you can see why she goes all over the world because she her favorite ride as a little girl was <laughs> the rotor. <laughs> she's like, bring it on, <laughs> like, uh, drop the floors <laughs> all the way through my life. But that was good, You're having gone through that. Wall. Yeah, you're still there, but <laughs> but having had those correspondences, and then then this invitation with Nikita, and and your booking kind of getting handled and everything, because underneath is like you wanted an experience, like show me, show me, spirit. I can't make any sense of what's happening. You know, as as hard as I try, I can't make any sense. And and then that's exactly the prayer of your heart. You know, God knows the prayer <coughs> of our heart before a word is spoken. So for me, it's fun sometimes with those correspondences. And then, you know, to see you just kind of reveling in the kitchen going here. And even this last brunch and everything, like, 
it's like spirit saying, okay, I will, I'll show you. <laughs> you ask for this. <laughs> yeah, and then your confidence starts to soar. And then you're more open to that soaring experience, you know, that's where it's just heading. But you needed this, this was, you know, very important. So I thank you for being so open and transparent. Thank you for even writing to me in the first place. And I know a dear friend of mine, Nook, you've got a, I think a retreat coming up with her too. She wrote The End of Death and so it's just, what an adventure, you know? <laughs> Tell Nook Nikita says hi. <laughs> That crack of willingness, you know, where you were saying, I don't understand what's happening, and then you had a crack of willingness when Nikita said, I see you here, and yeah, that's a little, it's all, it's a little crack is all that's necessary. A crack in the armor, a chink in the armor, and then the light streams through. I'm here. <laughs> mm. um, last night I had a lot of, uh, loss, really feeling deep loss, abandonment, um, a lot of hatred, like, what, like, feeling like, what's the point of joining with people if you always just end up alone? I mean, it was just, it was so intense, I didn't, I didn't even know what was going on. I, w I wasn't even doing it, I, c I can't even say I was doing it. It was just a flow of hatred for hours. And like, I didn't, I didn't want to pray, I didn't want to think about anything except hatred. I think it's passed a little bit now. And then this morning, uh, I woke up and I walked up to the bathroom and I met, um, what was her name? Diana. Diana. And, um, <laughs> she said that, uh, if I wanted an answer from the Spirit, and I said yes. And, um, <coughs> she said she was, she, she came here to meet with someone, and that she had woken up this morning and the Spirit told her it was me. And um, that I could come with her wow. to uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> And um, the other part of that story is there's kind of there's an ungratefulness feeling like I don't I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Like, make it obvious, make it obvious. <laughs> Is there another option? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Stupid guy. <laughs> if I could just share, because the rest of the story as you continue. Last night, Zach and I were in with Lisa Cairns and Ludwig watching a movie, and I was just there for a few minutes, but he said, Jason, can I stay and help clean? Because Marissa's staying and helping clean. I, I heard in my mind, probably not. And I'm like, probably not. <laughs> and I'm like, but what do you feel? You know, because you can't just be here unless you really feel that. He said, well, I just have no other choices. And I'm like, that's not, 
the reason to be here. This is like a Buddhist monastery where you've got to know it's your passion. And so that's Ludwig. Ludwig was did not want to come in a personal way, but was impelled to come here. So he shared his story. And it felt like you really heard it. And you're like, actually, I don't want to be here, you know. But you're just like scared that something wouldn't come in. So for me, this is just miraculous to hear hmm. you being activated yeah. this morning. It's, yeah, it's beautiful. This was actually six weeks ago I was told to come here because I needed to meet somebody. Mm. So oh, the wow. prayer was answered even before <laughs> it was asked. Yeah. Six weeks ago. It yeah. was it was already set. <laughs> Zach's answer was waiting six weeks to happen. <laughs> You don't need to know nothing. Isn't that cool? Yeah. It's so cool. Mm -hmm. And um, there's still like a oh. wanting to be here, but at the same time, there's there's like this. If I really feel into it, it still feels like a no, and it kind of makes me angry. Mm -hmm. It's just like you haven't realized it yet. <laughs> I think the con there's a context for all this that helps. It's pretty early on in the Course in Miracles workbook where Jesus says, in no situation do you perceive your own best interest. Not in some. It's very humbling. He says, in no situation do you perceive your own best interest. And it fits with what I was talking about at the movie l last night, that everything's backwards and upside down. And it's like those old, the old Poseidon, the, the Poseidon movies, you know, Side an adventure where every the ship capsizes and now everything's upside down. The chandeliers are on the floor, and there's these big ballrooms, and you find yourself on the floor, which was the ceiling, and now you're on the floor with a chandelier. I mean, what do you do with the chandelier? How does the chandelier help you when every, there's a pocket of air and the ship is capsized and it's all dark, and so you're you know chandeliers on the floor, and then where are the doors? These big rooms way up at the top. You've got no ladder and the door is up there. Everything is capsized and that's what this world is. And that's why it, it seems, you know, difficult to navigate. Probably you've been feeling some of these feelings most of your life or especially, you know, in the teenage years where you're saying, what is this place? How did I get here? And, and how do I get out of here? You know, it's because everything is upside down. It's everything is the mind is capsized upside down. It's got all kinds of pockets of things and, and forces going on and emotions. At times you want to just check out, find a way to just check out of it and avoid it. But, you know, as you're going through this and you're just opening and opening and opening, it's, it's actually, you're just given what you need. But, but it helped me to open up to the idea that I, in no situation did I perceive my own best interest. And then, in the next lesson, he says an amazing thing. He says, everything is for your own best interest. Everything. Without exception. Every no, every yes, every invitation, every turn down, everything is for your own best interest. And that is reminiscent of all things work together for good, you know. That, that there's a state of mind in which you experience that everything and has always been in your own best interest. There was never anything out of place. It was just misperceived from an agenda, from an expectation, from a misperception. It was never, nothing ever went wrong, ever. But it was just a misperception. But it just takes true humbleness. You know, there's an arrogance thinking uh, that you know something, like there's a situation that presents itself and then the mind goes, well, at least I know this and this and this. And the Spirit's going, no, you actually don't even know that. 
Now, some people ask me that, like, that seems a little extreme. In no situation do you perceive your own best interest. And, and why is that so? Can you give me a reason, David, why, why that is so? Because reality doesn't have situations. That, that we now, asleep and dreaming, have found ourselves in what seems to be a situational world. In fact, if you go into the Pentagon room, they have a room called the Situation Room. You know, basically life goes on and then when something happens that seems to be wrong or dangerous, they, sometimes they, they say, let's meet in the Situation Room. Mr. President, we've got a situation. What is a situation? What does a situation even mean? It's situational thinking is hypothetical thinking. So you have to see that the mind is addicted to situations. You know, it breaks the world into, into manageable parts and it calls those situations. And then when something goes wrong in that situational thinking, it goes crisis, conflict, problem. But this is how deep the rabbit hole goes, that, that as long as your mind's still thinking in terms of situations and still into those hypothetical what ifs, what ifs, what ifs, it's, it has no clue of what the truth is. It has absolutely no clue. So that gives you a little context for this. It's almost like, you know, you've got a blindfold on and you just hold out your hand and you're blindfolded and you have one prayer in your heart, it's take my hand. But your eyes aren't, aren't able to even see who's taking your hand or what direction you're moving in. Because the mind is so blind, so to speak, in this world, that it needs a lots of help to be led back into the light. And all you do is, 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 it's okay, the blindfold's okay. You know, you can trust, just hold out your hand and say, I need some help. And, and that was the prayer of your heart. You could do it verbally with the group, or you could just go to the, to the bathroom <laughs> and have that prayer in your heart. And, and have it show up very obvious, either way, it's just... <laughs> oh. <laughs> we, Nikita and I have a message too for you, to help you find it. Oh, Zach. Get, get Zach, we have like a very direct message to you. I heard like when I didn't even, I just met, like you sat down by like at the I th I think it was a movie you sat down and and I was just like I I had I had no idea about who you are where you're from but all I can I all I heard was you need to help yourself and the first step would be stop drop the drugs drop the drugs and every time and from then on every time I'd hear it's like drop the drugs like that's all what it would be so direct, so I thought I'd share that with you. Drop the drugs. I haven't been using anything except cigarettes, but I think that's what you mean. Cause yeah. like every time you see Jason, I had a cigarette, and so I haven't been able to connect with you. I just hear no more weed, no more need. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> whatever, yeah, whatever drugs that is. Like you, you came here. You know, you met me in Boulder, and you literally just like ran out to the car. Right as I was leaving and said, I want to come. I gave you my card and you came and you followed, and you took your steps. And one of your first questions when you came was, or I don't even know your question, to be honest. All I know is I heard this story of this young man that met David one time and went into a group and just could read everybody's mind. And he was like so in touch with the private thoughts of the world, but had a much deeper calling. And, you know, you don't fit into this world. You're seemingly 18 years old and you're having all of these experiences that we talk about and you you have a rapid calling to go much deeper and i'm just we're just saying if you want to answer that call it's realize you have no idea what your best interests are and you've got diana ready to take you to the next step and you can go past that those private thoughts really quickly by letting go of the weed and let the spirit like pull you through it the weed was just a a thing to like to help you deal with it and the spirit has a plan for you, you know. <laughs> like Charles Xavier. 
Yeah, right. you're Charles right. Xavier, exactly. Yeah, in yeah. our movie, yeah. X-Men, you know, he, he, he was so open and so telepathic, but he was like picking up all these thoughts and emotions from everything and everyone, and he couldn't deal with it. And he, he basically would say, I can't deal with their pain. And then he was told, their pain is your pain. And, and that's how we have to face it. We have to forgive it. We have to release it because th there is nobody out there. Even though when we seem to pick up people's thoughts telepathically and emotions, it's just a step. And then, of course, he, he was so angry that he lost the use of his legs that he found that if he you know, used this drug in high doses that he could get the use of his legs back, but he would not hear all those voices and he would lose all of his psychic abilities and his powers. But then, of course, you know, Wolverine is sent back and really joins with him and says, we need you, you know, to find, you know, yeah. Mystique. We need, we need you for the plan. We need you for everything we're here for. So he literally let go again of the use of his legs so he could tune in. At first he was like, I can't do this. But that's when he was told, it's not their pain, it's your pain. And, you know, it was a beautiful, there was a lot in that movie that really relates to what you're going through. The answers are all, all there, and, and all your mighty companions are here to support support you in, in accepting your function. Yeah. I, was, I was hearing a lot, too. I can't remember what section is, David. Maybe you actually remember specifically what that section that talks about you, you can't judge your advancements from your retreats or something like that. Not necessarily for Zach, even just for myself in this moment. I just was like really hearing that, like... I don't know. <laughs> but then I also started just thinking about, like, I know, I just know what feels good, like, holistically. <clears throat> Starting to know more and more when it's like, this is some kind of flimsy little gimme, 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 gimme a taste of something, versus, no, like, I'm clear, this feels good, and there's lessons available, and I'm open to them, and I'm not going to clench right now. I don't need to clench. Yeah. <laughs> in, in, when I was living in Scotland when I crashed and had a motorcycle when I got out of the hospital you know how in Scotland everybody's drinking and and especially the, the people where I was with so but when I went to drink the alcohol the perception switched and I, I couldn't stand the taste of the alcohol but um it was like I guess people pleasing I kind of because they kept saying, push through it, push through it, and start drinking again, right? <laughs> and I'm just wondering, because we were just talking yesterday about weed. I'm saying, you know, I, I got some weed back in the ass, but I, I don't think I'm going to want to smoke it, you know? But um, but if I do pick it up, I, I hope it tastes like like something really bad, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I hope. You already had a hint this morning, remember? <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's all just signs and symbols. So when, when you are really opening your heart for healing and you say, make it obvious, then we've all had that experience where something comes in a, in a contrast way to get our attention, you know. Sometimes it's just a little hint that, that it's gone, we've gone as far as we can go with that symbol. Not that anything's bad or wrong, it's just we've, we've used it, it's, we've gone as far as we can go with it. And there's much, much more in terms of our opening, our flowering, our awakening. And it happens with everything. It happens with relationships. Sometimes you're in a relationship and you can't even see it coming. But it, there's an abrupt shift that comes, a jarring kind of thing. And, it's, and initially the Holy Spirit, when the mind's so addicted to judgment and hypotheticals and situational thinking, it's almost like the mind sometimes needs like a depth charge, <laughs> you know. Or uh, what do they call that in Inception? A kick. You know, when, you, when you're in so many layers of dreaming, layers upon layers upon layers upon layers, you've forgotten that you're the dreamer of the dream, you're just way down on the screen and in some kind of s seeming situation, and you need a kick. Um, some kind of a jarring thing to get your attention to, to go, oh wait, what, what is this? Um, that's, that happens. That happens quite often. Or rug pulling, you call it that, getting the rug pulled out, you know. It, at the time, the ego is experiencing it as a devastation. But, you know, when you go past it and all of a sudden things start to open up that you didn't even see, 
you start to go, maybe this wasn't such a devastation. Maybe this was a wake-up call. And it could be like a, a sharp wake-up call even. And then there comes a point where you start to feel gratitude, like, mm. well, I, I actually needed mm. that wake-up call. And then things start to fall away. You know, not that you have to wrestle with them and call them a vice and, mm. and like battle with them, but, but as, you, as you start to awaken and you get deeper into your purpose and more clear, then things that once seemed important just naturally start to, you know, like water off a duck's back. It just, it rolls off. Kind of cracked the joke at the movie, um, Thanks for Sharing, because I used to, used to be pretty easy getting girls, and like for like the last year, it's like been a dry spell. <laughs> and, then, and then I was thinking, uh, the, uh, the joke that I made at the movies was, you know how, uh, which, watching all your videos, you know, the be passers by, and I, I said it at the movie yesterday, pass her by. <laughs> See, the spirit turns it around, huh? It goes from a dry spell into, okay, it's working, pass her by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes you have to. Yeah, you have to like pass her by. Yeah, you have to like spirit will give you like directions. It's like pass her by. Yeah, when there's uh, yeah, when there's unwinding. So. Okay. Um, I'm listening to everybody, and then David was referring to symbols, and, and, and my symbol in my life is so obvious. <laughs> uh, uh, to me, anyway. Um, I was sitting here earlier thinking, oh yeah, in every show, I, for the last 18 years I've been um, working with the persona of the bubble lady. And so I would um, invite all the families and kids and everyone to come to Bubble Land with me. Just want to go to Bubble Land. And so I'm sitting here thinking, have I arrived in Bubble Land here, where every bubble gets burst? All the bubbles are being popped. Before I was blowing the bubbles for others to pop them, and all my bubbles are being popped. And it's really cool. It's really, really, really cool but also the symbol of transparency in the bubble you know there's something there there's the veil there's that you know and the attraction the attraction to the beauty and the attraction to the lightness and the mystery and the you know what is it that we are attracted to so many people's in the bubble but you know you can go on and in the depth of it, it's not necessary i really just wanted to share that i think i've arrived in bubble land and I'm ready to have my bubble burst. Uh. <laughs> so thank you. I love you all. <laughs> You're all part of, you know, everything. <laughs> Bursting bubbles will pop each other's bubbles. And it's fine, because kids love to pop the bubble. <laughs> you know, it's like, break it, destroy. <laughs> it's not real. Yeah. David, you were talking about how sometimes spirit brings it abruptly. And uh, I didn't know when the process began that it was the abruptness. But um, a little over a year ago, I was diagnosed with cancer and had to make a decision about treatment and all that. And, and I really knew that as horrendous as it was going to be, I needed to do it. But it was for, for a deeper purpose than saving the body because I didn't believe that it was really a problem. But, and now I see going through that process and allowing these toxins and horrible things to happen to the body that the medical world does to save the body, I needed that process 
to break into the depth of fear that I was trying to work through on my own. That was the abruptness. And then afterwards in the recovery at some point you know i went back to work and could hardly do my job and i began praying for these mighty companions i mean big mighty companions to come not just people who did the course in my neighborhood or in my community and then chris and val showed up and and it was a glorious two months of learning and joining and seeing and the contrast when i would go to work during the day and coming home and they're there. I mean, the contrast was so great. And then what began to happen, and just now I'm saying, oh my God, that's what's been going on. I'm having a harder and harder time to do my job. My brain is, you want me to do this report? You want me, like my brain can't engage in it anymore. And before my brain stopped being able to engage in these tasks, my, my mind was, was saying, why am I doing this? Why do any of us do this? What's the meaning of this? This doesn't mean anything. And then the idea of um, food preferences started to fall away. I was vegetarian, had to have this and that, and it's like it doesn't matter. And then clothes preferences and earrings. And they just, like you were saying, it's just natural. They just start to fall away. They lose their meaning. And they're really, internally, there are relationships that have meaning but they don't, they're not holding me now. And all I know is I'm going back into an intense, uh, I'm not even going to say intense, but a lot of activity to go back to work tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but it really feels it's time to go. And, <laughs> was that Jenny? No, someone else. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, I heard it in Jenny's mind. <laughs> because Jenny has been a reflection of that for me for a number of years. Uh, and the process of leaving the government is kind of you do this and this and this, and so I'll do this and this and this. And, and in my mind, I, th I thought before the doing of that, okay, I'll volunteer and hopefully they'll accept me. Okay, maybe I'll do this and okay. And, and being here, it's like, I have no idea. All I know is I need to do the paperwork to leave the job. That's all I know. And that's by their requirement in order for certain things to unfold. And in the past in my life, I would run away. I'd say, I'm not doing it. I'm just leaving. I'm just leaving. And I'd run to another man, to another relationship, to another place. And when I moved to Berkeley, I ran away from Pennsylvania. And I said, I will not run anymore. And so the commitment is to be in integrity with my whole environment, to walk away in peace, and not blame anyone for this, except that it's my time Woo. to go. I have no idea what I'm supposed to say. I just know I'm supposed to speak. Sorry, blank. <laughs> I'm learning that blank's kind of a good thing here. <laughs> I hear application form and he hears Mexico. What? I hear the, the <laughs> application of Mexico. <laughs> Yeah, well, I've been hearing from the Holy Spirit. Your life's going to be like St. Francis. I wasn't really liking that too much, a little bit. It's like, who's going to be saying that? It's, um, but, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, it's been such an amazing experience being here with all of you. And uh, so many things that, you know, this this power of this joining and this, this love of the recognition and the celebration of this joining what's already joined is so blessed. And um, I'm just beginning to learn really what that means to give over completely to that trust in a brother. Um, like this expectation that you spoke of, David, and the pain and the of that 
and this fear of expectation. <laughs> and this week has been such a glorious lesson in really accepting. I didn't really understand what was given. It always felt like this is what you want to give me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm realizing that's really what I asked for. What's given is what I've been asked for. And, and I've just been given more than I could ever imagine um, from all of you in terms of just, uh, yeah, accepting that, that really love from my brother, like, you know, all these supposedly strange things that might happen in the world, and there would be a brother right there. I mean, it was so many miracles. I couldn't even cry without a Kleenex showing up. It was just <laughs> out of space somehow, and 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 yeah what a glorious glorious gift to to be in that trust um and to see this reflected everywhere that that's in the moments when it's known that that is what is <laughs> how precious that is so i boy the glory of the reflections here um Yeah, I don't know what to say. I guess these things are, I'm learning, they're all beyond words. And I will share one thing also that I have so much deep gratitude that you've helped me see my brothers, Jason and Nikita, all of you. Because it, it was something to say and to hear from the, from the Spirit, but to truly begin to just get this because of this grace, because of what you shared. And the Holy Spirit's been saying to me all week that grace, Son of God, unedited by thought, and begin to really believe the truth in that and see the truth in that is, I'm so grateful, you know, and to have faith in that. So I thank you for it, and I thank you for the invitation to be with my brothers. So I love you. Thank you. Just uh, one more thing to add to what I was saying is that it's n it's it's not that I'm leaving anything; it's that I'm being called home. So there is it just a shift in my mind to see it that way. It's not about anything being wrong anywhere. It's simply being called to come home. Thank you all so much. And I feel, I used to feel like a part of this community, and now I feel joined in this community. Thank you, everyone. Everyone beyond the everyone. My journey started in April when I went to um, the Quantum Love Tour in Kansas City. And all I can tell you is follow the prompts. I mean, amazing the signs that I was given and um, the stirring. The stirring, the restlessness, saying where I was, what. Um, that I, I'm kind of teasingly telling myself I was a trophy wife. Not on a big scale, but on a smaller scale in Missouri. And um, from the outside, it looked like a perfect life. But on the inside, I thought of suicide. And when I told my husband, he turned around and went and played golf. And did not take that seriously. And I thought, okay, something's got to change. And... Um, I called a girlfriend and I said, I'm either got to check in, check out, or head to a monastery. And I don't want the monastery to be an escape. And so I knew checking in meant drugs, checking out meant recycling back again. And a monastery sounded very good because I wanted the peace of God so bad. But I said, make it obvious. I don't want this to be escape because I didn't like the life I was in. So I sat in silence 
and I heard Spirit say, then create it. And I said, okay, what do I need to do? And um, I had been thinking about a divorce, and I'm just going, what am I going to do? You know, do I start over again? This was my third marriage. The first one was a divorce. The second one was he died of cancer. So here I am again in my mid-50s having to start again. But start where? So um, my husband said on a Friday, well, I'm going to a golf, golf tournament. I said, fine. He, he wasn't even telling me what he was doing anymore. We just got to be roommates, separate bedrooms, silence. We would go out to dinner. We had nothing to talk about. He came home on Sunday, and I said, honey, we've got to talk. I said, I can't keep doing this anymore. And um, I said, I want a divorce. We had another house that we had downsized, so we still had two double house payments for two years. And um, this is the funny part. So I'm going through Springfield. Okay, after I asked him for the divorce, in two weeks, I, we got agreed that on, on the divorce, we sold the house out of the blue. Mm -hmm. And I got a new job that I hate, because I hated the one that I was in. I was a dialysis nurse, and I, hospice has always been my love. So this job just appeared all in two weeks, those three things, because I said, God, okay, I'm ready to walk through that door of fear. What do I do? So I thought, okay, I'm going back to hospice. That's my comfort zone. I'll be happy. Everything's good. Okay, I go to this hospice, and I'm driving 100 miles one way, hopefully to get back to Joplin. Two days after I get on, they said they sold the company. Uh -huh. Okay, so I thought I was going back to a company with good management, and the management was good. But when the new people came in, they just turned it upside down again. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was just total chaos, insanity, and I'm going... I, I, I can't do this anymore. It's it's crazy. I, I would just sit there and watch everybody run around feverishly trying to people please this new corporation. And I'm going, it's not in me anymore. And I dreaded, you know, when I when you're in hospice, you love getting up in the middle of the night to go to a death call because you know it's a sacred time. And even my even my um beliefs about death has changed so much since really studying the course but I when I was in it the first cycle I really thought I was helping them go home to God and to me it, it's always been a very sacred time for the patient and for the family and so um, this time around it was like it, 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 it wasn't there the heart wasn't there and there was just that churning that churning ever since I had met Kirsten and, and Ricky and, and Helena, that one day, it just, just something switched. And I just couldn't get you all out of my mind. And I started watching YouTube and I started watching, you know, listening to Spreaker. And I mean, that's all I did. I lived in my office, plugged in to my computer. And I just knew that this had to be it. And so, um, I was in Springfield heading to Republic to see my patients at a nursing home and I stop at a stoplight and a van drives up and says, Messenger Plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the same day, you know, then I was like, well, I'll have lunch first. So I stop at Wendy's and I'm having a bowl of chili and there's a placemat and it says Strawberry Fields Salad. <laughs> Okay, so I went to the nursing home, and on the way home, the same day, the same day, okay, this is voting year, there's three signs that says, vote for Jeff Messenger, three in a row. <laughs> so my friend Sharon Brown, which who's down in Mexico, I text her all this, she goes, follow the prompts. <laughs> I'm going, how the hell am I going to follow the prompts? I got, you know, and um, so at that time... You know, I had already committed to my husband I'd stay with him for a year, get, get financially out of debt, because what I wanted to do was come here to community totally out of debt. 
with total commitment, my heart wide open. So I go home, and I mean, this, after seeing those prompts, she says, follow the prompts. So after a couple days, I'm just going, and, and watching what's going on in my job, and I'm going, oh, I can't do this. So I went ahead and texted Helena and Kirsten and, and um, Ricky. Well, Ricky and, Hel uh, Ricky and Kirsten had just taken off to go to California. And they said, call us, call us. And they said, well, we just found out someone else has taken a jump from California. And she may be going down to, um, to Mexico. Well, you know, you might be going down there too. And I'm going, oh no, I can't. I got a trip to Grand Cayman with my husband. I've already made these commitments. And I, she said, fill out an application. So I got off the phone, got, went home that night, filled out the application, turned in my resignation and told my husband that I'm leaving in two weeks. And it was, you know, just a few days before strawberry started. And then, then I said, okay, I'm gonna cut my losses. I'm gonna ask for this amount of money. And Spirit said, ask for five more. Ask for five more thousand than what I was, you know, cutting my losses. So he kept the car. I, I signed off everything. The divorce, the house, the car, everything. Took, I was gonna take two suitcases. <laughs> And, and Patrice, I called Patrice, I heard Patrice was coming in at the same airport, and she says, no, cut it down to one suitcase. I'm going, how do I take my whole life from what I did in two weeks down to one freaking suitcase? I mean, really? Okay, so now I'm nine pounds over, and I'm giving away my clothes and my furniture, so I don't have to pay that extra money going to Mexico. So that's been my journey. All I can say is follow the prompts. <laughs> I mean, everything just fell away. And, you know, my husband, you know, I know he's sad that I'm gone, but he wishes me well. He, we knew that we couldn't stay together because our, our, our um, interests changed. His was golf and mine was God. Okay, so we got, we got the first two letters right. <laughs> you know? And, and he knew that. And then he goes, he goes, well, I want to come back another lifetime. And I said, honey, I'm going with David. He says it's this lifetime. This is what I want. You know? So, I mean, everything just fell away. My daughter, she's autistic. She's kind of sad about it. But, I'm, you know, I got to kind of wean her off. Wean, wean me off of her. But yeah. she's doing okay. And then my son's <laughs> heading to Guam on the 19th in the Air Force. So, I mean, everything's just fallen into place. So I know this is where I belong. And I thank every one of you for showing me the love and the acceptance and the challenges and the mind games that I have to clean out. And things have come up that I never expected. But there was always a mighty companion for me. Like I was saying, I wouldn't trade the world. And I said, yes, I would trade the world for this. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the only way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are. But that's been my thank you, thank you. So follow the yeah. prompts. That's great. Well, the three of you sitting together, too, it's like, Serena, Kay, Desi, boom, boom, boom. He goes down. Oh, a triple. <laughs> a triple punch. Grand slam. <laughs> Grand slam. Here we go. <laughs> That's right. Extra. Because <laughs> it's practical application. It's really going for it. These are witnesses. You know how they say, give me a witness. You are showing some witnesses here. Whoa. <laughs> That's powerful. It on, yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. I've been here for a month now, and uh, before that, uh, I just felt uh, such a deep, 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 deep calling to to serve and to extend. I've been studying a course for some years, and. Uh, but I've never been in a study group or uh, anything like that. Never talked to someone who had done the course before. Never been to a retreat. So everything always by my own. But I felt I, I can't go on like this. It's 
something uh, something must happen. Uh, so I I had been seeing the web page for some time, and I said, yeah, I think this is something for me. So I contacted Jenny by email, and uh, the title was to serve. Uh, I just can't compromise anymore. And we had a talk and uh, came here. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, it, it has uh, actually been my best month in my whole life, without any doubt at all. Uh, The other night there was the film Lucy, and I, I just felt I, I can't watch this film. <laughs> I, <clears throat> I want to. I have so so much to 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 extend, and I just think like watching films all the time. It's. Uh, That's not what I want to do. I want to do the films. Uh, so I had a talk with, with Salita, and he said, yeah, you go outside, sit here for a while, then you can go in again if you want. But I didn't want to go in. So I went back to the cocoon, and I meditated. And I got this so strong, strong prompt, like... Uh, you had to start right again. And a few nights before, I had told some, some of the guys that, uh, yeah, I was writing novels and poetry and stuff. And, and I said, I will never do that again. I don't feel like that. Maybe if I could do it with somebody, then it's, everything would change. But i writing alone again? No, never. But then I felt this this thing coming down on me that I, yeah, you're going to write again. Did you know I'm a writer? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I, I asked to, to, I asked Salita if, she, if he could call up Jenny so we can have a talk and I went to her cabin and Francis came and and uh, yes, and I said, go ahead. You don't have to watch all the movies if you want. You can you can write. And because all, even being here with all the tasks and everything, I have been feeling that I can't get it out from me what I really have to give. And uh, and yeah, they said, yeah, you can go on and do it. So I went back to the cabin and I started to write some poetries and that felt so good to just even if it's just words and uh, even if no one ever gonna read it but it feels like I could start to extend as I wanted and I don't know if it's gonna keep on like that, maybe I won't write anything more, but I'm so happy to be here and being able, having the opportunity to to share everything that's being downloaded. I want to upload. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's about it. I'm very, very great, grateful to all of you and to the Holy Spirit that had, has guided me to be here with all, all of you. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Francis is counting now. She says, there's four in a row. <laughs> She's like throwing her arms up. Yeah. 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 <laughs>
That was Francis' life. You all are giving <laughs> versions of, like, yeah, yeah. I did it, you did it, we're all doing it. <laughs> Yeah, um, oh, wow, I just, I'm so grateful to everyone who's really, I mean, it's just, I can see myself in everyone. <laughs> it's just me. And, uh, I feel like there's an invitation that's been coming, um, I feel a real loosening of something and a letting go of something. I, I've been feeling a lot of resistance leading up to Strawberry Fields for a while, it kind of going in and out of um, glimpses of something and a, a, a beingness and then kind of moving right into a fear, lots of fear and resistance and anger. And I, I just feel so grateful right now, and I feel like there's an invitation to be, to step more fully. It, and I have to admit, it came with two of Serena's sharings, two different times. And it's so interesting because uh, we've really been joining a lot during this time. And it's been very powerful in her expressions and her sharing there's been a real and honesty. I mean, the honesty is like, <sighs> nothing's held back. And it, something in me really, it's like she's, in a way, it almost felt like she was doing it for me. But I also feel there's an invitation for me to step into that. That kind of, um, just not, nothing held back. Expressing, exposing, just, just letting it go. And, um, and that kind of willingness and commitment. I can feel there's a commitment and I can feel in that word <laughs> there is some fear. Commitment. <coughs> yeah, and I can feel oh, right away what's coming is um, even in making decisions, sometimes I can feel I have to make the decision and then there's a kind of a, a, a like a little dance that happens. And it's like um, I just it's not me making the decision. It's I want to step into the certainty. I want to step into that surrender. And I can see even, even in stating this and sharing this, it is a bit of a declaration. And there is a little... Yeah, a little fear in that. But I also feel that there is an invitation here and that I needed to state it out loud and say that I see there's an invitation and that I'm willing or I'm willing to be willing, whatever willingness there is here, I'm willing to step into this. Thank you, everyone, because I know I didn't do, didn't arrive where I am in this moment 
alone. This was an everyone, everything moment right, right now. And I'm just grateful. Thank you. Last year after Strawberry, um, well, during Strawberry last year, um, I was more raw than I am this year. <laughs> or, but, and um, I remember wanting to come and, and find community and safety, and I wanted to hide. Um, I wanted to hide again from everything I was feeling. And um, after I left, I didn't know where I was going to go or what I was going to do. Um, I had a son that was moving to New Hampshire. My daughter was in Evanston. and I just was clueless. Um, I just knew, the, my kids and I knew that we had to somehow separate or we wouldn't heal or wouldn't come out of this. And um, I literally for six weeks did not know where I was going and... and I think I remember at one point saying to David, I said, I don't want to go back to Indiana, or I, I don't know, I just said it to the group. And I would kept praying, please send me any place but Indiana. And um, <laughs> what happened was there was a vocational rehab for my situation, and um, there was a program that if I came there and studied, they would give me housing. And... Um, the program that I was to go in was um, <laughs> the way of forgiveness. <laughs> there was a woman down there that's been teaching A Course in Miracles for 25, I don't know, 30 years in the church within. And um, so I moved down there in the first four months, true to my form. I pretty much went to class and then just went home and just kind of stayed and prayed and do my thing. And... and um, and I, again, I was praying. I said, you know, God, help me. Help me get out and, and get out and meet people and do things. And um, I was doing a lot of meditating, and I get this message from Thomas St. Clair that he was feeling a vibe to come to Indianapolis, and he wanted to come to Hermitage. And I'm, I was like, okay, what's Spirit up to? <laughs> you know, now what's going on, you know? And um, he ultimately came out um, for a month, and pretty much, you know, did his thing. And I kept trying to go out and meet people, meet different people in the community. And um, one of those groups was this place called the Playful Soul, which I really love because they're just like really crazy people, music and dance and all this stuff. And um, what I really like to do is play and dance. And um, the woman there asked me if I wanted to begin a class of, uh, with movement and dance, and and my mind was like, no, I can't ever dance again. I'm not ever dancing again. I'm not doing it. Um, so long story short, um, through this time that I've been in Indianapolis for seven months, it's like I'm connecting with the Buddhist faith, the Muslims, what I call the New Agers, my hippie friends that are out in the fields in Serendipity and Cloversdale, and then Louise with the Course in Miracles, and. Um, I just find it interesting how much I've been begging for community, and it's all around me. And um, But I sure would like all of you to come out there and visit me anytime you want to <laughs> in Indianapolis. <laughs> so um, if I can't be here, please come make community everywhere with me. I think I just want to share one thing with that because 
Yeah, when Danny said, he wrote to me, I want to serve. And I had been in this prayer because we had this old motor home in Sweden. And we needed someone to help us to sell it because none of us were there, you know. And then I was like, how do we do this? We had motor home and everything. And then I got this email from Miracle Center. <laughs> and it was Danny. And, and it said, I want to serve. And I said, okay, thank you, uh, please help us. And he he actually sold that motorhome, like, I think, like in a week for us. Yeah. It's, <laughs> really, it's just beautiful how spirit works. I think it went fast because he wanted to come here. <laughs> right there. <laughs> he said that was the reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we will be extending a lot. I've, I've spoken at the church within there in Indianapolis, and I had friends still there in Indianapolis, and and it's yeah, not that far from Cincinnati where the Peace House is, I would launch out. So there's lots of, of that extending coming and, and it's beautiful to just have invitations like that. To just, sharing community is really sharing in the heart and rejoicing together and, and uh, it really, you, it just gets so into that soaring experience that it's beyond time and space, it's beyond location. You know, where people say, what are you doing locally? And sometimes I'm, I'm like, locally? What is, <laughs> what is local? <laughs> I don't understand local anymore. <laughs> right. It's... The rabbits. The rabbits. <laughs> are, you, are you hearing something about rabbits? <laughs> no, just like, we're here, so the rabbits are our local community. <laughs> 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 I'll go out and see see you preaching to the rabbits. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's kind of our vibe right now. We don't really know, you know, what's happening in form at all either. So, um, but it does feel like a real extending vibe. So, yeah, keep us in mind that way. I know. Um, yeah, next weekend, Francis and I are we're heading to the the Bay Area, then we're coming over to um, Iowa, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and then the following week I think I'm flying to meet, Patrice is picking me up at the airport and then I'll go back stay with Patrice and Anita, then, then we fly to Mexico for that retreat down there, and we were going to mention that Mexico retreat. Yeah, next, uh, it, felt, it felt good, I just had a feeling that we should really announced that the next celebration is happening in Mexico. So if there is a if there is a desire to keep going with this deepening, to keep going with the vibe, like to keep going with this um, learning of this new way of thinking, like to learn to think anew, Mexico would be the place. And the retreat is uh, from the last, sub the last week of September. September yeah. Yeah. <laughs> last week of September. Yeah. So um, yeah, it just felt like such a. It felt like a big prompt in my mind to really announce it to everyone because I kept hearing here and there it would be mentioned. Oh, by the way, we have a retreat in Mexico. I was like, oh yeah, by the way, everyone. We have a retreat in Mexico, it's happening right after, like soon after this. So everyone is really, everyone who feels the draw, this is like, this is it. This is it. into this program it's on. It's on. okay um, after I got settled into my apartment uh, the person that got me into the program got fired and there's no one they've never done this 
for anybody to have this kind of program where they pay for your housing and so forth. And Louise Dunn was the founder of the Church Within. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. <laughs> or quantum. Things show up and it's in, in amazing ways and it's just the perfect thing for you and it takes it away from, yeah, thinking things. We have props that show up and then they disappear. And then we're like, wow, that prop was just here for me, that little thing. Okay, well, I think Patrice will have you wrap it up for us, because we, we wanted to get some group photos too, and have a little circle out in the sunshine before the, uh, the brunch. Yeah, I just wanted to extend that there's, there was never a decision to go to Mexico. It was told, and I just heard. So, there was a call that said, I'm going to be there, can you pick me up? I said, I don't have a car, but I'm sure Anita will let me borrow hers. And then you said, yeah, well, I'm going to fly out to Mexico. And then the words were, oh, I think I'm flying out with you. And that was, there was no decision to be made. And that's really what it felt like. It was just... I'm informed what I'm, t what the next step is, or what I'm to do, and I don't know why, I don't know how. I just, yeah, it's just the willingness to, yeah. Anyway, so uh, the only thing I wanted to extend was just that it's, it doesn't feel like a decision that has to be made, other than just to hear, and and follow the calling, and that's all. So. Well, that's a perfect way to wrap up the. <laughs> We're all going home and we're just listening and following the calling. Thank you. Thank you all.